Genesis chapter 9. <clears throat> well, I get this connected here. Genesis chapter 9. Come on now. There we go. Hit that, hit that, and that. Voila. Genesis chapter 9 has got a lot of things in it. The uh, death penalty. The death penalty for murder. Taking another man's life is in Genesis chapter 9. We're not going to get into that tonight. But that's really the first place that God established the idea that if a man takes another man's life who is innocent, that's murder. And that man then should likewise also be killed. Capital punishment is in the Bible. It's biblical. It's not that God hates man. God actually is pro-life. Jesus said, I've came to give you life and that you might have it more abundantly. The liberals in this country and around the world, they say they are defenders of life, but they're not because they do not believe that those who murder somebody else, they do not believe that their life should be taken. So what they're doing is they're actually rewarding murderers by giving them life, by giving them three meals a day, a place to sleep, sit and play cards all day, and get drugs snuck in. That's their reward for killing somebody. And God said it plainly in Genesis 9, if you look in um, verse 4, the flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall you not eat? And he said, surely your blood of your lives will I require at the hand of every beast will I require it. And at the hand of man, at the hand of every man's brother, will I require the life of man. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God made he man. And so God instituted the death penalty here in Genesis 9 before he ever gave the rest of the laws that we have when God sent the laws down to Moses. And of course, capital punishment, execution of man, was built in for several things. Who can name some of them? In Moses' law, what was, what was an offense worthy of death? Number one, murder. Adultery. Here you go, rebellious children. If a man and his wife, this, this boy, it would take a lot for, for a family to do this, but if they had an incorrigible child, one that was reprobate, a drunkard, would, like a lot of teenagers now, and if they would not respect mom and daddy's authority, Mom and daddy were to go to the elders and the elders would take that child outside the city and have them stoned to death. That was a sign to the people and anybody else's child. That was a sign to them. You have to obey authority. You have to do what's told. And we're living in a time right now where parents are actually telling their children, hate the police, despise law. Do what you can to get out of everything that you do. I'll help you. That's, that's the mindset of a lot of families right now. And it's wrong. And God set forth an example. Anyway, I won't get into that night. But let's look at Genesis chapter 9. We're going to look at the symbolism of what he says here. The number 9 represents something in the Bible. Genesis chapter 9 verse 1. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful. There's the theme there. Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every fowl of the air, upon all that moveth upon the earth and upon all the fishes of the sea into your hand. 
Are they delivered? You know, that's something I overlooked in my study. Of course, I was tired last night anyway, trying to put this together. But I'm going to, I'm going to concentrate on that, I think, next Sunday night. This idea that God instilled it into every animal. That bird that landed, that wren that landed on Brother George's Bible. That was an exceptional thing. Okay, that would, that would just bring me to, if I'm reading my Bible and I see that thing light on my Bible and stare at me for a while, man, that'd put me to tears, amen? That doesn't happen. Birds just don't fly to humans. Okay? Deer don't come up to me in the woods and say, I'm ready. Okay, they just don't do that. Squirrels don't do it either. So anyway, I might look at that a little bit deeper. I might look at the spiritual aspect of that next week. It'd be, it'd be an interesting study. But let's study this tonight. Be fruitful and multiply, multiply and replenish the earth. And like I said, God exhibits the way he sees life on this earth. It is God's blessing to every creature on this earth to multiply the species, to fill the earth with species. And you look around and this world, no matter where you go, is full of life. It's full of life. Even the most barren desert, there are species in that desert that God has designed that they can live out there. And they're fruitful out there. They know how to get by. They know how to preserve water. No, they know how to find water. I've seen elephants dig into the ground, showing their young, adult elephants showing their young how to dig into the ground and get water up out of the ground by digging it up. That, to me, is amazing. And you can't tell me that that's all by accident. That that species just invented that millions of years ago. It was an accident that one elephant figured that out and the rest of them, I just don't believe that at all. So let's go to prayer. Father, we love you. This word to us is very special. Everything that you teach us out of it, Father, is amazing to me. And I love life. I love the life that you've given us here on this earth. Father, it is a life worth living. Everything that we see, everything that happens, no matter how bad, no matter how good, the Lord is a lesson in life. You're teaching us something. You're abiding with us. You're shadowing over us. And you show us in everything that you do that, God, you are in favor of life. The Bible says that you created this earth to be inhabited. In every space, every desert, every woods, Every city park, every backyard is full of life. And Father, we thank you for showing us that you created every species, every bird, every worm, every squirrel, every deer, every dog. You created every one of those to bring forth and fill this earth with life. We understand God's a picture of heaven. And what heaven's going to be like. Heaven is going to be full of life. So, Father, we love you for that. We ask your blessings on your word tonight. We pray this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said. So, the number nine, we're, we're in the ninth chapter of the Bible. And when I went to look for the meaning of the number nine, I had a couple of books I read. One was by E.W. Bullinger, and it was on Bible Numbers. And then another one, a more recent one, by a, a Baptist evangelist by the name of Ed Velo. And he studied the King James Bible and learned God's numbering system in the Bible. And he made a list, and I've looked at that list, and I said, God, that's great. That's, you know, maybe you showed him something, but I want to be sure that I know what these numbers mean. So show them to me in the Bible. And that, of course, you know, I'm, I'm looking at the Genesis chapter and... You know, the number sevens for completion, God into the world. We looked at the number eight. The number eights for new life and new beginnings. And you see that in Genesis 8. You've got eight people. And at the end, I, I love this in verse 22 of chapter 8. While earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night. There's eight things here. Shall not cease. Because even when God destroys this earth, 
He's going to make a new one. What do you think that one's going to look like? It's going to be glorious. There's, I believe there's colors that we can't see right now because of our limited eyes that in that new earth, we're going to be able to see them. And we're just going to go, oh, this is awesome. And we'll be like that for eternity. It'll never fade away. And our excitement and our awe and our love for God's new heaven and new earth will never wane away. Can you imagine that? I mean, we, we kind of get excited about something, then we kind of calm down and it passes away. But in that new heaven, that new earth, it will never pass away. That's what I like about it. Amen. And then God says, I mean, first thing out of his mouth in Genesis 9, is be fruitful. Multiply and replenish the earth. So imagine all these animals coming off. They had put the clean animals in by sevens, put the unclean animals in by twos. They're all there. Noah took care of all of them. Probably a lot of them slept. That'd probably be a good way of doing it. But they're all coming off the earth now. And I believe at that time that all of the land mass of the earth was just one great big continent. I don't think God had divided the continents yet. We'll get into that in Genesis chapter 10. We'll see it. So all the landmass there of the earth is, everything's all one. And we know that in South America, there are species that don't exist anywhere else on the earth. How did that happen? I think God directed it. I think God took the species that he wanted and they migrated to a certain area that God directed them to. It's just my, my way of thinking. So that when he divided the earth, there they are. Same way with species like in Asia or in Russia or in Europe or in Africa or in the North American continent. There are species up here that don't exist anywhere else. And I think God, as they come off the ark, God migrated them out. And as they migrated out, of course, I think God also waited for the earth to spring forth grass, leafy vegetation. Because that's the cycle of life. Some animals, I'm a vegetarian because I eat animals that eat vegetation. That's how I'm a vegetarian, okay? I eat cows and cows eat grass. I eat pigs and pigs eat stuff, okay? So anyway, God had to wait, I think, for the vegetation to spring up so that these animals would have something to eat. Once they start migrating, once they start feeding, they start procreating, the seasons of life take place, and then all of a sudden, after a few years, you've got thousands and thousands and thousands of animals literally all over the place. And I don't think it took very long either. But just think about that. God favors life. God favors being fruitful in our life. Okay, I uh, had a phone call from a, one of our followers today and he said, Pastor, I'm right with you. He said, I can see your emotions today. And he said, I had them last night. He said, I'm looking at these pictures that you posted. And he said, it just blesses my heart that we're able to help these people that we don't even know. Able to feed these people that we'll never meet in this world. And he said, I, I like being part of that. Gives you a good feeling, amen? Doesn't make us better people. It doesn't make us, we don't, we're not worthy of more heaven than somebody else. It's just in us to want to benefit somebody else's life. That's what being fruitful is all about. Why do apple trees produce so many apples? Why did God be, and how many seeds is in one apple? Was well, there dozens, right? So imagine an apple tree that's loaded down with apples. Why did God make it that way? Well, they reproduce that way, but a majority of apples get eaten. God did that to feed his creation. So we eat the apples, other species eat the apples, they like that. Then other species eat the species that eat the apples. I mean, it's the cycle of life. 
But in all of that, God is causing them to be fruitful. He favors that. By the way, the, the phrase, be fruitful, is in your King James Bible exactly nine times. And I, I just went, that is cool. How did the translators do that? Did they do that on purpose? They couldn't have. They were just simply reading the text, the Hebrew and Aramaic and Greek New Testament. They were simply reading the text and they translated it as faithful as they could. And it just happens that that exact phrase in the Bible. I mean, how many times could it be? You've got 1,189 chapters in the Bible. Surely there could be more than that, but there's not. It's exactly nine times in the Bible God said, be fruitful. And I love that. Think about this. There's your number nine. The gestation period of a woman. Nine months. God did that because other species have different gestation periods. I'm not positive. Somebody might look this up. But I think humans are peculiar in that the human gestation period is exactly nine months. And I don't know if somebody, somebody looked that up. Do, are there other species who's just, I think there's a Wikipedia article on this. And it gives you all the species of animals and how long their gestation period is. And I think humans may be unique in that. I'm not positive, but I, I think that. Okay, so God's signifying to us this number and what it represents. Now turn to Luke chapter 1. Here is the, you know, I talked this morning about God manifesting wickedness so that it, that it can be seen for what it really is. And in that sense, that's what fruit represents. It represents the fullness of something. When you see an apple on a tree and it's red or when you go, when peach, I love peach season. And I've learned when you go out to Eckert's and go to their peach orchards, I know just to touch them. I know just to touch them. And if I can just, if I can dent it a little bit, I know that peach is ready to be eaten. And I don't fail to eat it. If it's a little hard, I leave it alone. It's not time yet. But I think this idea of fruit being ready is a sign of things that are ready, the fruition of time. So when it comes to the coming of Jesus Christ, both his first coming and his second coming, God is waiting for a certain time. He's waiting for a period where something is going to be Full. It's going to be in season. And when Christ came the first time, I guarantee you God knew the exact season in which to bring Jesus to this earth the first time. And I believe God knows the exact time that he's going to do it again. Amen? So look at Luke chapter 1 verse 26 in the sixth month. And he's talking about the sixth month of Elizabeth who didn't have a child. She was one of these women in the Bible that could not bear a child. She wasn't fruitful. But then she cried, God heard her cry, God opened up her womb and made her fruitful. So in the sixth month of her bearing John the Baptist, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin, a spouse to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail! Thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. That part of the Catholic prayer is right. The rest of it, pray for us sinners now in the time of our death. That's not in the Bible. But this part is. She was highly favored of God. She was blessed among women. And, you know, you've heard me talk about the Mormon version of this. The Mormon version of this has God, Elohim, literally coming down from heaven, going to Mary's house to lie with her. That's wicked. That's not, that is against the scripture because the Bible says she maintained her virginity in all of this. And that is not how it happened. Because if Elohim, God, came into her, then, 
After Jesus is born, she is with Joseph. She's an adulteress according to the law. Ain't right. Ain't right. So verse uh, 29, And when she saw him, she was troubled at this saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary. And of course, you know what I believe by that. When we read it, it's just words. But I think there comes a time when normally we would be afraid. And if God says to us, fear not, I think all fear is removed. I think God has that ability. So we're troubled at what we're seeing going on in our country. We're troubled at what's going on in this world. And it bothers me. Sometimes I, I can't stand to watch any more news. I have to turn it off because I am, man, I'm just like freaking out. I can't take any more of this. God's going to lead us along and God's going to be with us every single day. And I think God's going to give us a spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called, here it is, the son of the highest. He literally is God Almighty's only begotten son. And the Lord shall give unto him the throne of his father David, because Mary and Joseph were of the lineage of Judah and of the house of David. Verse 33, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And his kingdom, of his kingdom, there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, Look at this, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. He... Christ is the fruit of her womb, born nine months after conception, born of a virgin. Amen? You follow that so far? Notice, notice how it was done. It wasn't God Elohim coming down, knocking on Mary's door. Hey, Mary, how you doing, babe? It wasn't anything like that. It was the Holy Ghost overshadowed her. And all of a sudden now, she conceives in her womb Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He is fully God and fully man. I don't quite understand that, but I believe every bit of it. Amen? Now look at verse 39. Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste into a city of Judah and entered into the house of Zacharias, which is John the Baptist's father, and saluted Elizabeth. And it came to pass, I love this, that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb. Amen. You know what that means? It's murder. To take a child out of the womb and kill it. Why? John the Baptist was full of the Holy Ghost in the womb. And when women say, that's my body, I have a right to it, it's not the same DNA. That baby has its own unique DNA. It's not part of her body. And God is writing down every abortion in this country. And they're going to pay for it. The blood of innocent children, they're going to pay for it. So Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost, verse 42. And she spake out loud, out with a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou among women, and blessed, look at the word, is the fruit of thy womb. And the phrase, Holy Ghost, exactly 90 times in your King James Bible. So where does 
the fruitfulness of our life come from? Being filled with the Holy Ghost. So, when you love somebody that maybe you would find it normally not easy to love them, that didn't come from you. That came from the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost put that in you. When you're in a situation, and I've been in these, where you are extremely troubled, and you are very fearful of what could happen, but then God puts something in you, and you say, you know, I just trust God. And no matter what He does, He does it. And I trust Him. That's peace. Where does that come from? It's the fruit of the Holy Spirit. It's what the Holy Spirit put in you. When you have a joy over what God has done in your life or over what God has done in somebody else's life, when you get that joy, you know, we've got people in this church that like to get a little happy every now and then, raise their hand. I don't have a problem with that. They're not showing off. And I don't blame anybody else for not doing it. It's basically up to you. But some people just like to raise their hands and express the joy that God has given them. Where did that come from? It came from the Holy Ghost. And the phrase, and the exact phrase, Holy Ghost, 90 times exactly in your Bible. How did that get there that way? God put it there. God, remember, God is a God of order. God is a God that when you study Him, you can kind of figure Him out. You know Him because He has rules and God has order. And God speaks in order. His, this book is not chaotic in any way, shape, or form. It all has an order to it. It all has a plan. Everything in this universe, we see there's an order to it. Same way with your Bible, because the Bible is the thing that put this universe in place. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb. Holy Ghost, 90 times. Now, the phrase Holy Spirit. Does anybody know how many times that's in the Bible? Holy Spirit. Take a guess. Seven. Just seven times. And how many spirits of God are there? This Bible's in order. Nothing out of place in this book. Amen? I told you I was giving you dessert tonight. This is lemon meringue pie, coconut cream pie, chocolate pie, apple pie, chocolate cake, Twinkies. Turn to Genesis 17. Genesis 17. Look at here. Look at what God did. Remember, God's a God of order. God lays out patterns for us. Rhythms. Um, cycles. Repetitive things in the Bible. He gives lists in the Bible. Count those lists. You'll find something there. If it's eight times or nine times or seven times or three times, you'll figure it out. You'll understand the order and the nature to it. Genesis 17 Genesis 17 is where God transforms both Abram and Sarai to Abraham and Sarah. He, trans he changes them. And Isaac is not born until after this conversion. Ishmael is. So Ishmael represents the child of the old nature. Cursed, in bondage, cast out. But then God changes Abram. And now Isaac can be born of him and Sarah. And look at what it says. In Genesis 17, 15, God said unto Abraham, As for Sarai, thy wife, thou shalt not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall her name be called. And I will bless her. Look at this. I'll bless her. And give thee a son also of her. Yea, I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be of her. Then Abraham fell on his, upon his face. I would have too. And look what he did. He laughed. Now he's not mocking God. Why do you think he laughed? He got so happy and so full of joy that laughter came out of him. Amen? 
Again, he's not mocking God. He's, look at this, laughed and said in his heart, shall a child be born unto him that is a hundred years old? And shall Sarah, that is, how old is she? Ninety. Just like the phrase Holy Ghost 90 times in the King James Bible. And it was the Holy Ghost that overshadowed Mary that caused her to have a baby nine months in her womb. And it was the fruit of her womb. And Jesus is the fruition of God's plan for mankind on this earth. Do you see that? I love this. And Abraham said unto God, O oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. And God said, Sarah, thy wife shall bear thee a son indeed. And thou shalt call his name Isaac. And I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his seed after him. And it happened exactly the way God said. Abraham, 90, uh, 100 years old. Sarah, 90 years old. I mean, come on. Even in Bible days, they're old people old people and yet here is sarah 90 years old and she's going to bring forth the fruit of her womb and isaac is a picture of jesus look at the ninth book of the bible of the new testament galatians matthew mark luke john acts romans first second corinthians galatians uh i've got galatians 5 22 there but before we look at that, you're there in chapter 5 and look at verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Well, let's count these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. There's four. Idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath. That's ten. Strife, seditions, heresies. Envyings, murders, that's 15. Drunkenness, revelings, and such like. I missed, yeah, there we go. 18. That's nine times two. It's still a multiple of nine. The number nine is here. These are the fruit of what sin does in a person's life. If a man who doesn't drink gets invited to a bar and then he starts going to a bar every Friday night with his friends eventually what's that man gonna do he gonna drink the seed was there it was planted and the fruit of that seed what he sowed in his life was drunkenness it's an inevitability if, if a man puts his eyes on a woman that's not his wife and he keeps doing that, the inevitability of the seed that he is sowing into his heart is going to end up in adultery one way or the other. It's the fruit of what seed is planted in us. And the devil knows how to plant seeds. Amen? So that's why there's 18 here. It's the fruit of unrighteousness manifested in people's lives. And he says, in verse 21, As I've told you in time past that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. By the way, you can look at that number 18 a different way. 6 plus 6 plus 6 gives you a sort of a different way of looking at it, but it's the same thing. So now look, and he follows up right after that with verse 22, the fruit of the Spirit. And remember, we're in the ninth book of the Bible, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, nine. Against such there is no law. And think of these fruits, love, we talked about that, joy, joy comes from your peace. When you're in a, when the disciples were on the ship and Jesus was asleep and a storm came up and blew the ship around and the disciples were afraid, so they woke Jesus up. Master, carest thou not that we perish? 
Reg Kelly said, it's the dumbest question in the whole Bible. <laughs> of course the master cares. What's the first word Jesus said? Peace. Peace. Be still. And immediately the storm stopped. I've had experiences where devils were all over me driving me, compelling me, making me like crazy in my mind. And then, boom, gone. Just like that. And I could tell they left. Because instantaneously you get, the chaos is gone, the cloud of confusion is gone. And you've got a, you've got a spirit in you that is just full of peace. And you say, God, thank you. Thank you. That was a gift of the Spirit. A gift of the Spirit. Peace, long-suffering, gentleness. I'm praying daily for gentleness because I'm finding the older I get, I get cranky easy, and I don't like it. I don't like it. So I'm praying every day for God to put in me goodness instead of jumping at somebody and being crabby with them. I don't like that. By the way, faith, faith is required for salvation, but where did it come from? The Holy Ghost. I mean, think of all these people out here. Do they, do they believe in Jesus? Do they even know him? No. And why not? God hasn't opened their eyes. And that's the point. God has to open your eyes. God has to give you faith. Faith is a manifestation of God's blessing in your life. The fact that you believe every word of this Bible is because the Holy Ghost put it in you to believe it. I will never forget the day when God said, Mike, this Bible is right, every word of it. And I went, it is. It is. No evidence. Nothing. I accepted it right then. Believed everything in this Bible. I knew it was 100% right. Reg Kelly tells the story. He preached it for the Lonnie's camp meeting. First time I ever heard him. And I'd listened to him preach three sermons already and I was scared of him. This is the, right after my wife was going, how come you don't preach like that? I was mad. So he preached a message, uh, what was it? I can't remember what it was, but it was about the King James Bible. And at the end, he said, I'm going to call you guys out. You guys have been amen to me this whole message. He said, I'm going to call you out. And he said, everybody in this room who believes that this King James Bible is the absolute inspired, inerrant word of God, and you're not ashamed of it whatsoever, I want you to stand. And buddy, I jumped, I was the first one to jump up. And Reg remembered that. He remembered that. He told his church that story. And he said, my Corker was the first one to jump up. And I said, it's because I'm scared of you. <laughs> you know, even then, I had maybe just a little bit of doubt left in me. But over the years, God's driven every bit of that out. I believe this book. That's a gift of the Spirit. It's the fruit, meekness temperance not and i hate the other translations that call that self-control it's not self-control being tempered is something that's done to you when you temper steel what do you do to it sterling heat it up and then what cool it down real fast and that changes the molecular structure of it strengthens the steel it's something that was done to that steel not something it did for itself it's not self-control. It is temperance. It means that you will endure and God will make sure you will. So I, I'm putting out a Watchman broadcast right now. And I'm talking about what Jesus said. He that shall endure unto the end shall be saved. And I've been criticized for believing that verse. Criticized by so-called King James people saying that I believe in a work salvation. And they said... We believe you don't have to endure. I'm going, you're crazy. You know what? You probably won't. They probably won't, Sterling. But he said, 
He that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Well, who's going to make sure you endure? The Holy Ghost is. Against such there is no law. Now look at 1 Corinthians 12. 1 Corinthians 12. He gives us a different set of gifts and fruit. But the amazing thing is, there's still nine of them here. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 4. Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. There are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. And think of your body. Your body has a kidney, your body has a heart, your body has lungs, it has a stomach. Do the kidneys do what the heart does? No. Does the lungs do what the stomach does? No. They all have their different parts, their different roles to fulfill. But it's the same God who has given you every one of those parts. And in this church, there are differences of people, differences of ways that they do things, different things that they like versus things they don't like, or things that they're good at versus things they're not good at. You've never heard Sterling Leonard stand up here and preach a message. And you never will. He just, it's not him. Okay? But it is me, and sometimes I can't shut up. So look at what he says. Verse 8, For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom. That's one. Word of wisdom. And I have men in this church that I rely on for wisdom. Because I need it. I, I need help. To another the word of knowledge. There's some... You say something about the Bible, they instantly know where it is. Now, how did they get that? God gave it to them. God gave them a desire to study. You don't just, you don't, God just doesn't download the Bible into your mind. Don't believe that stuff. You read it. And then God just gives some people the ability to memorize it, to know it, to, to have it right there. It's the word of knowledge by the same spirit. By, and by the way, every one of these come from the Bible. Every one of these gifts come from the Bible. To another faith. Faith cometh by hearing. Hearing by the word of God. By the same spirit. And you know, there's just some people that just have more faith than others. Even in this church. There's some people. And I'm, I would never say who I think it is or never say who I think it isn't. But there are people in this church who just loaded with faith. Loaded with it. And you know what? God will use them to bless you. They'll be, be the ones telling you, you know what? Give it to God. You know what? Trust God. You know what? We're going to pray. We're going to ask God to help you with this. That, God gives them that gift. By the same Spirit to another, gifts of healing. Even healing is a gift and it comes from the Bible. By the same Spirit to another, the working of miracles. I still believe in that. To another, prophecy. To another discerning of spirits. I've met men who, I mean, they could tell. We had a preacher here. I won't tell you who it was. But he preached here one time and he left. And then we had some bad trouble here. You know what? He called me and he said, you know, I don't know what's going on in your church. But while I was there, he said, I should have told you this. You were going to have trouble out of two women in your church. And he named them. And sure enough, it was them. Sure enough, he discerned that, okay? God gives that to people. And to another, diverse kinds of tongues, and to another, the interpretation of tongues. So I believe that this Bible was translated correctly because one of the gifts of the Spirit is the interpretation of tongues, Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic. I believe that. These are all, and there's nine of them here, there's all gifts of the Spirit, and God will impart them to whoever he wants. And God may give you one for a while. And then he may use you in a situation and give you another one right then and there. I believe God will do that. Amen. These are all gifts from God. Turn to John 15. We're almost done. John 15. This is what I meant a while ago. Yeah. John 15. God... Loves fruit. He loves it. It's like my dad. My dad was a gardener. 
I mean, he gardened every year. Grew stuff, amazing stuff that he made me pick. He made me pick butter beans and I couldn't stand butter beans, but I had to pick them. But he had that gift to garden and it gave him great joy to pull something out of his garden. He'd set it on the table and he'd say, that slipped in the garden last night. Say it every time. He was proud of the things that he put on the table because sometimes times were hard. He fed his family when we didn't have no money, okay? God put that in him. That was part of his nature. Look at this. I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch of me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. God cannot stand barren branches. He will not tolerate them. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Look at this. You think God loves to see his people bearing these fruits and these gifts. Of course he does. And the more they bear it, the happier he is. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. You'll never know the times that I spent years ago praying for this church. Praying that in spite of me, God would bring forth fruit in this church. And I'm here to tell you, the fruit is all over the world from this church. And I didn't do it. I'll never, ever take the credit for it. It was God who did it. God who did it. That woman that I showed you the picture of this morning. We were talking about her after church. We're going to make sure that she's given every chance in the world to survive. We're going to make sure. Just like God gave us those four children that we took and had them placed in an orphanage, we're still taking care of those kids. We bought extra food for the whole orphanage because food was getting scarce everywhere in Kenya because of the virus. And again, I don't take credit for that. God melted our hearts. My wife bawled. She cried. Can we do something for these kids? Michael couldn't sleep at night. And it's the same way with this dear, this dear woman. And above all else, I want to make sure she knows she's going to heaven. That's the kind of fruit that God manifested in this church that none of us deserved it. None of us did. And yet God chose to do that here. I had a lady send me a message on Facebook and she said, how did you feed these people? And I wrote her and I said, we're just a little church here, Festus, Missouri. We just got a few people, but we got international reach. God's given us two radio stations. God's laid it on our heart to start feeding people. And I said, I've never asked for a dime from anybody. And yet it all came in and we fed these people. She wrote me back and she said, what's your church address? Amen. Let me finish this. Verse 6, If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will. And it shall be done unto you. That's faith, people. When you catch that one, you'll be blessed, I promise you. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples as the Father hath loved me. So have I loved you. Continue in my love. And how, we read it this morning. How will we know if a person's a real born-again Christian? He told us, by their fruit, you shall know them. By their fruit. And I've made mistakes treating people wrong. And I've asked, beg God to forgive me for that. God, manifest love in me. Not stupidity. Not just jumping out in anger. God manifests love through me. That's what I want. Okay? Let's go to prayer.